Bom dia a todos. Uh, um, I, uh, the first thing, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I have to apologize. I will speak in, in English and not in Portuguese, but uh, as Eduardo knows, my Portuguese is so bad that <laughs> it's better to, to, to use English, at least on my side. Um, do you see my... Uh, Just my uh, my screen. Yes, it's fine. Okay, perfect. So, just my um, my presentation will be. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to to present myself. The, I'm uh, Christian Leduc. I'm an hydrogeologist working in uh, a French research uh, institute, working uh, only in. Uh, thousand countries, that's, that means in, uh, in Latin America, in Africa, in uh, Asia. And um, so always with um, research dedicated to uh, developing um, uh, policies and uh, development. So um, I will present some, uh, some ideas taken from my uh, My, uh, my work in many, many different countries. I'm, I've always been working in semi-arid uh, areas. So uh, all my um, examples of my ideas are taken from these uh, semi-arid areas, and, uh, including, of course, uh, Nordeste of Brazil. So uh, the first, uh, first of all, is in the question of why um, do I focus on uh, semi-arid areas? It's um, because it's uh, something very, very interesting for for me. Uh, of course, we have many many things uh, common uh, that are shared, uh, whatever the, the country. Uh, we will find uh, just a question of. Uh, high variability of, uh, of rainfall, high variability of uh, uh, water availability and, uh, and so on. And at the same time, we will find also a lot of big differences between one semi-arid uh, area and uh, another one. So this mixing of uh, common points and differences is very, very interesting, very stimulating for, for researchers. Something very important for, for me is that all these countries, all these uh, areas are very heterogeneous. I mean, in terms of uh, physical processes, in terms of uh, social uh, behaviors. And uh, This makes them very, very complex objects for, for research. But uh, this is, once again, this is something very, very interesting, very stimulating. So, um, and we can summarize it in um, two, two different uh, explanations. The first one is a scientific one. It's um, so many research questions that we can be addressed there. It's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, ground for, for research. And I think um, in these areas, much more than in temperate uh, areas, we still have a lot of things to, to discover, to, to find, to understand. So, uh, Even for uh, younger researchers, I think it's uh, just much more stimulating to work in semi-arid areas than in temperate uh, countries. And the, the other reason, which is at least as important, is the fact that uh, we needed to, to, to answer to, to societal issues. I mean, in these countries where often just water availability is rare, where water resources are often very, very highly exploited, the question of best water management, or at least better water management, 
is a very crucial uh, issue. So um, this is a mixing of uh, science and uh, societal uh, issue is, uh, is very important for, uh, for me. And in fact, uh, this question of uh, scientific stimulation and uh, it's mainly depending on the people who, who work. If you're not really interested, if you're not really active, proactive in your research, you can do a very uh, quiet uh, research. But uh, if, you, if you are a bit um, um, searching for new, new ideas and so on, you can find a lot of uh, wonderful uh, new ideas. So this, this is my, uh, just my intent in, in expressing this dependent uh, divorce. It's just that uh, you will make your own research uh, interesting or flat, depending on the, your uh, own investment in, uh, in, this, uh, in this work. I will take, um, I will share my uh, presentation in three um, small chapters. The first one is um, just uh, what I mean, individual curiosity. It's if you pay attention to your environment, you will find that you will discover a lot of things, but this is only depending on, on yourself. The second, um, it's a group curiosity. I mean, uh, because we have plenty of things to, to understand, it's much better to work with colleagues from other disciplines. And I will show some examples of uh, uh, scientific advancement because of uh, working with uh, other disciplines. And the third uh, small chapter with, will be just a, a curiosity that is mm, even amplified because of working in uh, in network in scientific networks in different uh, continents different countries and i will take the example of the arid network where we have many many people from uh, uh, from uh, Brazil, from Africa, from, uh, from uh, Mediterranean countries uh, involved. So the first thing is just about uh, individual uh, curiosity for me. Uh, this means that we have always to, to, be, uh, um, to be actively uh, looking at uh, many, many things even out of uh, uh, your own uh, discipline. I mean, just I'm an hydrogeologist, but if I'm just uh, staying in my um, domain of uh, hydrological competencies, I will miss a lot of things. So this is the first thing to, to, to go uh, beyond my uh, own uh, frontiers. The second thing is um, just uh, when there is something surprising, you, you, you must not discard the, the observation. You should ask why uh, you, you feel surprised by this uh, information, by this observation, and try to, to understand um, just uh, the real meaning of, uh, of this surprising uh, observation. And the third uh, quality uh, that is required is to, to be able to, to question uh, ourselves about uh, things that we may consider as uh, certain. And in some cases, they are not that certain. Or oh, they could be certain for other um, climatic areas, but probably not that uh, obvious for semi-arid uh, areas. So this, I mean, these three uh, qualities are um, just um, very, very uh, necessary for, for, for advancing in, uh, in research. So I will take a first, um, a first example. It's taken in the lower uh, valley of the Senegal River in uh, Western Africa. And this, uh, I will show you a very short uh, movie. This has been um, taken by colleagues working in this area. Just on this is a picture now. 
you see this is a, a very flat region and in the in the rainy season, there is, of course, a, a big flood, uh, the annual flood of the Senegal River, which covers a very, very large area. And some uh, piezometers that, are, um, that have been drilled in the region, they, they will have water all around. And uh, just we, we can see our colleagues just uh, uh, going and making some observation uh, in um, piezometers in in a piezometer in a in an area that is uh, completely flooded for uh, for some uh, some months. So I will just uh, launch the video and um, we will speak of that later. Okay, <laughs> so you you just saw that in a few seconds uh, there were uh, there was some air blowing out from uh, from the piezometer, and it's uh, in a few seconds it was able to 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 fill in um, just uh, this uh, this bag of uh, about one uh, one hundred uh, uh, liters. So this means that in the um, in the flood uh, season there is some air going out from piezometers. And I've been um, working in semi arid areas for 40 years now, and I've never seen such a thing. And this is only because my colleagues told of this uh, surprising uh, phenomenon. And that because of they, they took that, uh, that movie, that um, I, um, I was really convinced. And in fact, when you look in, uh, in the bibliographic references, you can find it. It's called uh, Lys effect. Lys is a small uh, town in uh, the Netherlands. And this is the first place where this uh, phenomenon has been observed. And uh, of course, if you if you want some uh, some information uh, more, you you can see the whole video. It's a small video of a few few minutes. But this is surprising to to see uh, just uh, air going out from uh, from aquifers. Uh, we often deal uh, deal with uh, water, but uh, air is more surprising. Sorry, okay. So, and my first uh, question is, uh, we were lucky because we had uh, our colleagues uh, available and uh, they have been working in, uh, in bad conditions. You, you see, uh, you need to, to be completely uh, wet for accessing the piezometers, but Without that uh, availability of colleagues uh, for controlling the phenomenon, we would not be sure of, uh, of the phenomenon. And uh, they were uh, warned about the phenomenon by, by a, a farmer who worked there and uh, who told them that there is some noise uh, from, uh, from your piezometers. And my question is, imagine if I'm, somebody goes and meets uh, a farmer uh, who tells there is some noise in the piezometer, who will believe this information? Who will trust this information? And in fact, this information was true. 
that uh, so this means that this is the first uh, example, uh, probably one of the best examples of uh, unexpected uh, phenomenon. But, uh, and we must be uh, careful to, to everything. Another ex example of uh, exceptional phenomenon, it, it, it is in the south of France, along the Mediterranean Sea. We have a um, multi-layered aquifer with the Pliocene sands, which are mostly a confined aquifer. Uh, over there is a, an alluvium deposit in con an hydraulic connection with the Erault River. And so in most of the time, just um, the head in uh, the Pliocene sands is higher than uh, the head in the alluvium which means that there is an outflow from um, the Pliocene sands to the alluvium. But when there is a flood in the uh, Erold River, of course, the river rises very quickly. The level, the groundwater level in alluvium uh, will rise quickly too. And so there is an, an inversion of uh, hydraulic gradient for a few hours, a few days. This is what we can see, for instance, here, just during that flood for a few days, there is an inversion of gradient. Here, there is a small inversion. Here, there is a small inversion. But uh, in uh, 74, there was an inversion that has lasted for five months. And we were lucky to, to have a long, long time series of observation for about 30 years. And this was the only event in 30 years where we had an inversion of gradient that long. So this means that if we just had a few years of observation, we could never imagine this exceptional inversion which means that millions of cubic meters of water, of groundwater, finally flew from alluvium to the players and sense instead of the inverse uh, way, uh, which is a usual way. So this means that we were lucky to, to, to have that long, long time series of observation. And without that, we couldn't understand the change in water quality uh, in, in this area, close to, to, to the mixing uh, in the valley. Another example of uh, exceptional phenomenon, it's uh, in Tunisia in uh, 69, there was a big, big flood and um, just it has been calculated that this, uh, the return uh, time for for this flow is um, several uh, um, centuries or perhaps even one millennium. So it's, it's uh, very hard to, to, to identify exactly the, just uh, this, uh, this uh, chance of uh, a new event that way. But in fact, it was so, so violent, so destructive everywhere that plenty of uh, railways, of um, roads were destroyed and hundreds of people died during that, uh, that event. And in this small uh, catchment where we have been working a lot, which is a small catchment of about uh, a bit more than um, 1,000 of square kilometers, just um, maximum peak flow was about uh, 3,000 cubic meters per second. I don't know if you feel, if you imagine how violent it may be. And because of that uh, violence of, uh, of surface flow, we had an increase in groundwater recharge and um, groundwater uh, at that time uh, has been uh, rising for about 10 meters. And this event, uh, of course, we, ne we never saw uh, uh, such a big uh, recharge of, uh, of the aquifer for, uh, from that time. So 
we were once again we were lucky because we had measurements starting a few months before that uh, that uh, that big flood. Otherwise, we couldn't know uh, the impact of uh, of the groundwater recharge. So the question of uh, about this uh, this big. Um, an exceptional event. It's um, that's, uh, it's partly depends on uh, if you are lucky or not lucky. If you're lucky and you're just uh, there at the right time uh, in the right place, you can find you can observe uh, wonderful things. Uh, unfortunately for you, if you're uh, somewhere else, you you miss completely the, the information. So this is because there's uh, events, um, there are some uh, decades, some centuries back in the past. We, we need always to look for former information, for past information in old reports, in old uh, books and, uh, and so on, to try to, 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 to understand them and to, to evaluate their their importance and their, their impact on, uh, on, on water resources. And um, also it, it sends us to, to, to the question of uh, the, um, the temporal inertia of the systems. Um, and um, this is uh, especially uh, obvious in, uh, in hydrogeology. We have to consider long times and long times, it may be some decades, some centuries, or even some millennia. For instance, when working in uh, in in Africa, in uh, in the desert part of uh, of Africa, we have to go back into the past up to ten thousand uh, years for understanding the present uh, water resources uh, we found uh, we find in in aquifers. <clears throat> so I will move to this, uh, uh, another um, scale of observation. Of course, when we consider uh, semi-arid semi uh, hydrology, we have to take into account um, the rainfall. This is uh, something obvious. We have also to consider all the human uh, works that have modified um, the surface flow and the groundwater flows. This may be a big dam like this, but this may be uh, much smaller uh, things. But there's two uh, first components, uh, natural components uh, as rainfall and um, artificial components like dams and, uh, and so on. They are obvious, but we have also to consider many, many other parameters, many other drivers of hydrology. For instance, just at uh, termites, uh, to, um, those who, who already knows, know me, uh, you, you know that um, I like termites a lot because uh, they are very, very efficient. Uh, workers for uh, semi-arid hydrology. I will uh, explain it a little bit. Uh, this is um, just uh, an infiltration, infiltration test I made uh, some decades ago in, uh, in Niger, in semi-arid Niger. For the first um, 20, 20 minutes, there, will, there was a very, very small uh, infiltration rate. And then just infiltration increased a lot and it was about 10 times more than in the first uh, part. And this, is, um, this was only explained by just the opening of a few of a small um, gallery uh, dug by a termite. So this means this termite was just it's uh, about one two millimeters uh, of uh, diameter, and in fact it was enough to increase a lot the global infiltration rate of my uh, testing point. 
And this means that, in fact, uh, if there is a termite uh, colony there, or if there is no, uh, um, act, no biological activity in the soil, just the infiltration will be completely different, whatever um, just the granulometry of, of the soil. And just if you look at, uh, at this uh, slide, it's exactly the same uh, experiment, the same infiltration test, but while using some, uh, some water colored by uh, uh, methylene blue. And um, just uh, this uh, area uh, is a dark blue. It's where most of water has, uh, has gone. Just in this uh, dark gray, it's um, just where a lot of water has gone, but much less than in, in the blue region. And the third color, this, uh, this one, there is quite no water passing by in this region. So even in a very, uh, in a soil that could seem very homogeneous, in fact, uh, we see uh, with this kind of experiment that there is a, a very uh, uneven circulation of uh, groundwater, of water in the soil. And this means that um, just uh, most uh, of uh, water infiltrating will go through macroporosity and not at all um, along the usual porosity. And this is why uh, you can link it, you can link it with, a, with the termite uh, activity. I will give you some explanation. If you, this is a millet field uh, as we can find everywhere in, uh, in the southern uh, Niger. Uh, if the farmers, uh, after taking in just uh, the millet uh, productive parts, uh, the, the seeds, uh, if they let just uh, the leaves and the sticks uh, just on the ground, this will give a lot of uh, food for, uh, for termites. So you will see a lot of uh, termite activity, a lot of galleries. So this means that there is a, a good uh, infiltration capacity for water because of uh, galleries. And this means that just when there is rainfall, a big, the largest part of rainfall will infiltrate in the soil. So this means that there is a limited surface for enough, and most of water will infiltrate and will be available in the soil for, uh, for, 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 uh, for crops and, and for uh, natural vegetation. So this means that um, just uh, with um, termites, we will uh, get a, a better uh, um, production, a better crop production. But you see that this completely depends on the behavior of uh, farmers. If they let uh, the leaves uh, just on the ground, or if they take uh, away for, for instance, for, for, for selling and, and so on. And in fact, something very uh, uh, common uh, that um, just this parameter of uh, surface uh, runoff uh, ratio, um, just the part of rainfall that it will uh, flow very quickly, it's mostly depend on uh, biological activity. And uh, you can uh, ask uh, most uh, hydrologists, uh, they will measure uh, surface runoff, but they will never uh, observe uh, termite activity. The second thing we have to consider is just to, to, to meet with uh, other colleagues from uh, other disciplines and to, to, go, to go ahead for better understanding. Just you, know, you all know this um, metaphor of, uh, of the blind people touching, uh, each of them touching a part of an elephant and uh, trying to understand what they, they are touching and expressing and, 
no, no one uh, has the same feeling and the same understanding of the, the object they are, they are touching. And uh, this is um, this is why we need to, to 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 gather colleagues from other disciplines. And for me, <laughs> the best place to to advance in uh, in sciences it's close to the to the coffee machine for uh, just uh, discussing uh, without any uh, real uh, short term uh, interest. But this is a place where you will uh, you will. Uh, get information, we will exchange information, and this is one of the best, uh, most efficient place in a, in a research uh, building. I will give uh, an example, uh, again, from uh, central Tunisia. Uh, in this um, area, we have been uh, working together, hydrogeologists, and uh, we had a uh, a young colleague working in uh, anthropology, and um, and of course our uh, previous work in uh, in this region, um, this was that uh, there is a small river that has been much more important. If you see at uh, this uh, uh, this picture here um, on the right. It's um, just a large, large valley with quite no water. And for most of the year, there is no water at all flowing in, in this valley. And some days each year, there is um, one, two, three floods, but a, a small, rather small floods. If you look at this uh, other picture, it's the same, just a few centimeters of, uh, of water flowing. So this is uh, a, a large catchment with quite no surface uh, runoff. And uh, for us uh, hydrologists, hydrogeologists, this idea of a, a very small flow was something obvious. We have been working for uh, two decades in this area, and the small amount of uh, river flow was uh, something obvious. And our colleague, uh, anthropologist, um, tried to, to, to understand. She, she went and spoke with a lot of people. And she also went to the National Archives of um, Tunisia. And she, 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 was, uh, she had searched for uh, old information. And finally, she she saw that the, at the beginning of the 20th century, there has been a, a, a trial between just local people and a, a French colonist who, who had a, a big, a big fazenda there. And just as they were discussing about the possibility of taking 100 of liters per second from the river. And when you see the river now, it's impossible to get, uh, to get a, a permanent flow of 100 liters per second. So this means that if people were uh, able to, to argue and to, and to spend a lot of time and a lot of money for discussing, this means that one century ago, there was a much bigger flow. And finally, we, we saw, some, uh, saw some, some information about the, just the traditional sharing of water between people, uh, has been modified with time. And this was very interesting for uh, our colleague uh, anthropologist. But this was also revealing for us hydrogeologists, hydrologists that uh, the whole environment has changed since one century. And so even if you look at very uh, unusual information like uh, uh, judiciary uh, papers, uh, it may be uh, revealing, it may be uh, providing a, a lot of uh, information. 
and this was this this kind of discussion between anthropology and hydrogeology was very uh, stimulating. We had uh, just a different uh, vision at the beginning, and finally we 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 meet. Uh, we sorry we met to to a common point that uh, this uh, change uh, was that big. Always in the same region, we, we can consider another uh, phenomenon. Uh, if you look at the number of wells, of uh, boreholes uh, accessing groundwater, uh, there were very few in the middle of the 20th century. And by now, they are in this region, they, we are more than 10,000 uh, wells and boreholes in, uh, in this region. It's, uh, and especially in the last uh, 20 uh, years, it has been increasing a lot. So uh, if you want to understand why the, there is a so big increase in, uh, in the number of wells, of course, you, you can refer to uh, obvious explanation. There is a big increase in uh, irrigation, so there is a need for uh, for water. So there is an increase in in wells, obviously. There is also a, a technical explanation because it's uh, much easier now to to find um, a drilling company for making a well than uh, twenty or thirty years uh, ago. And for economic reasons too, because it's just uh, the cost for drilling is much uh, cheaper. Uh, so this has very simple reasons. But in fact, we have also at the same time human reasons. For many, many people in the area, if you are able to pay for a well, this means that you have money enough. And this, uh, this is a kind of um, element of prestige for, for a farmer to be able to, to have his own well, even if he doesn't really need it. And um, another thing that um, just a farmer's life uh, is not that easy in, uh, in that region. They are not rich at all but they often can rely on external members of uh, the family who have gone to the coast and uh, to the big cities and who can send some money for preserving the family um, heritage. And so this money will be used for uh, well drilling. So even if you don't need it, just this uh, external inflow of money will be very, very important. And the third thing is um, just um, with, uh, with time, of course, when the father dies, of course, uh, the, the sons will share the, the land. And often each son will, uh, will try to, to get his own uh, well. And uh, on this uh, pictures, you see the first generation, there was just one well, which was enough for uh, giving water to, to the whole area. But when he, he died, just uh, he, um, the land was divided in uh, among the two sons and each son wanted to, to have his own well. So this one, this new well was created even if water was uh, enough from this uh, first well. And at the third generation, it was divided in four lots and each uh, piece of land has got his own uh, well. So the, this increase of, uh, of wells is not explained only by physical agronomical reason, but also by uh, uh, sociological reasons. And if you don't work with, uh, with, with people working in, uh, in sociology, in, uh, uh, you won't never uh, be able to, to, to understand that, uh, that process of uh, increasing the number of ways. 
I will um, take you for just a few um, a few seconds to to a very different um, area. Uh, I will take you to to India in uh, in central India where uh, I'm working uh, by now. It's um, a dry uh, a dry area where groundwater is taken from a, a basaltic uh, layer, and in fact. We can, uh, when you discuss with people, you will find that they often uh, take water from different sources. For instance, they will take water from, uh, for drinking water from one point, they will take water from, uh, uh, for uh, irrigation from another part. So, and this, uh, this first um, division of uh, the water sources may be explained by uh, logical reasons. I mean, uh, just the groundwater quality and, and so on. But you will find also other uh, explanation. And um, in, uh, in India, just a traditional system of caste is very, very present, uh, whatever the official uh, declaration of uh, the governments. And the highest caste, which is the caste of uh, Brahman people, they, uh, they consider themselves as much better, much higher than uh, other castes. And they, they, they do not want to, to share water to take water from places where lower caste will take water. So in some areas, you will find um, just a, a water source that is used only by Brahman people. But uh, as an hydrogeologist, when I make my measurements, I don't pay attention to, um, to the people who are coming there. As a Brahman, as a uh, for lower castes and, and so on, but this is very, very important to 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 consider, and this once again I need to 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 discuss with uh, with colleagues working in uh, in sociology in uh, human geography for understanding this uh, differentiated um, access to to water. Um, something completely different, but uh, another example of um, the, the benefit of uh, interdisciplinary works. Um, this was in, uh, in France, in the Rhone Valley, um, and uh, we were uh, some uh, hydrogeologists and some uh, hydrobiologists uh, working in the same building, and we were just alone in a remote building. We were, uh, I don't know, five, six persons, and um, just all the, um, the other colleagues were uh, in another building. And the fact that we were together, we were discussing much more than uh, with other colleagues. And finally, we discovered that we had many, many things in, uh, in common. And finally, we saw that um, some, uh, some species of uh, walls were uh, good indicators of uh, groundwater, surface water interactions, and especially some, uh, some species of uh, annelids, uh, walls, were uh, typical of high, uh, high flows between the surface and, uh, and groundwater. And just this was very interesting because this revealed that uh, just a, a warm survey over the, the bank would give information about the groundwater fluxes. But it's, uh, as an hydrogeologist, I've never learned that uh, worms could be a, a good uh, indicator of, uh, of uh, groundwater uh, flows. But this is, uh, and this idea just came because of our uh, geographical proximity. We were just in, uh, close to uh, all together, and so we, we had time for, for discussion. 
I will just skip for, for a few seconds, just uh, uh, for another example on the same area. We decided to make uh, a typical uh, tracer experiment with something very common in, uh, in hydrogeology in this, uh, in, this, uh, in this area close to, to the bank, to the river bank. And we, we decided to, to, to put some, uh, some tracers. It was a colored tracer, it was a rhodamine. And we had some uh, piezometers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, and so on. And, uh, and of course, there was a, a general flow from the river to groundwater. And we, uh, because the tracer was just injected in that part, we were expecting that the first place where we should see just a tracer uh, movement was piezometer number, number two. And in fact, this is not at all what we saw. We saw the first place where we saw some uh, tracers, it was in number five, which was more, much further and not in direct uh, connection with, uh, and this was very surprising because um, this area, it was a very, very uh, pervious uh, sediment with a high velocity of water. And we were expecting a, a very simple uh, scheme of groundwater flow. And even if in a such a favorable uh, place for, uh, for this experiment, we had a big surprise. And a big surprise over a few meters. It's not a question of a, a wool aquifer with uh, some heterogeneity. No, we had a heterogeneity over a scale of one meter and even less. So once again, uh, this means that even in very uh, well studied uh, areas, we always have a surprise as soon as we go uh, more into, into details. So it's just um, there's a lesson of always uh, uh, going further for, for information. So um, my, uh, the, the, the conclusion for the second part would be that uh, if we want to, to work in, um, efficiently in uh, interdisciplinary uh, cooperation, we need to respect other disciplines. We need to, uh, to, to, to hear at, uh, at their explanation, to hear, to understand their their, their way of working, their way of developing uh, research. And we, we may also uh, accept to, 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 to ask questions to our own uh, ways of uh, doing a research. And I think it's, uh, it's available for all disciplines, environmental disciplines, uh, human sciences, uh, social sciences, uh, for all uh, scientific disciplines. My first, my last, sorry, my last uh, uh, part is uh, dedicated to uh, just going even further than the close uh, interdisciplinarity with colleagues uh, that you can, uh, who you can meet uh, often. And uh, this um, just a, the big necessity of, uh, looking at uh, international literature and to, to get information from even very remote areas, but uh, where uh, processes may be uh, the same, where uh, human behavior may, may be more or less the same. And so this is why it's so important to, to exchange with, uh, with colleagues from uh, other countries, other, other continents. So I will take the example of uh, ARID. Uh, just uh, the ARID website is hosted by uh, Funseme. And uh, this is uh, a, funny, uh, a funny network because there is no, no money. So there is no, no fight for, for, getting, um, for, for getting money. But and our main objective is in fact 
is to, to, to compare the different sites we, we are working on in these different uh, countries and to, to go further in the, in the interpretation of, uh, of, uh, of our observation. We already made some, uh, some webinars and there are some uh, courses uh, available and many of them are still to, to, be, to be implemented. And I will just take one example of uh, just a comparison we have made in the ARID network is that in many of our sites, there is um, an increase in the groundwater level uh, in spite of uh, climatic condition, in spite of uh, increased uh, groundwater exploitation. So this may be surprising, it, it is surprising. So, I mean, it, it doesn't uh, occur everywhere. For instance, in the Nordest, uh, there is no increase in, uh, in groundwater level. I'm sorry for, for, for Brazilian people, but, uh, uh, but this is uh, the fact. And the first uh, analysis is that, in fact, there is no connection with um, climate change. Because everywhere in the um, in on, over the Earth, there is an increase in the global temperature, and uh, more or less uh, uh, rather stable uh, rainfall. So we can't explain that there is uh, this increase is because of uh, an increase of temperature or, or an increase of rainfall. No, not at all. So the other explanation is that there is an increase in the groundwater recharge. And um, because it's not a natural process, we have to look for uh, human uh, uh, activities uh, at, um, that, that could cause this, uh, this phenomenon. And in fact, this, uh, this means that in, in many of our, our sites, uh, this means that uh, just uh, human activities have a much, much bigger impact on uh, groundwater dynamics than the climatic change. And finally, this, uh, in many different places, we had this increase, but when we look at, uh, at these uh, different types of increases, uh, according to the countries, in fact, they have different causes and different um, processes. And we will uh, have a short look at this. So easiest, uh, the simplest uh, example is in the uh, southeast of, uh, of Spain. There is an increase uh, of uh, irrigation uh, areas, and there is an increase in uh, water uh, used for uh, irrigation. And so this means that part of the excess water for irrigation goes back to the phreatic aquifer. And this will explain the rise in the phreatic uh, groundwater level, which we can see here, for, for instance, much higher than a few decades before. So this is simple. We have just uh, one explanation. It's just the, the excess of uh, irrigation water. If we go to the central uh, Sahara, Sahara Desert in uh, Algeria, uh, we will find some uh, places, uh, especially in Wargla, in El Oued, where there is a, a big increase um, in the groundwater level, in the phreatic aquifer too, but with another explanation. It because since 50 years now, uh, there have been a lot of deep, deep uh, boreholes that have been uh, drilled, uh, some uh, hundreds uh, of meters deep, and they are taking water from uh, a confined aquifer in a complex terminal. And so this means that uh, there's boreholes are artesian and uh, groundwater will flow at the surface without any, any real control. And because these um, areas are not well naturally drained, this deep groundwater flowing to the surface is not drained to, to other areas. 
and it will accumulate. Of course, a, a large part will evaporate, but it will also accumulate. And in, um, it's an, um, an ugly paradox that in, in these areas with uh, traditional palm trees uh, oasis, we have a lot, a lot of palm trees dying and they are dying because of an excess of water. Not at all because in the middle of the Sahara, they are not dying of thirst because they have not water in us. No, it's the opposite. They have too much water and they die because of this excess of, uh, of water. The third example I will take is in uh, Nouakchott, Nouakchott, the capital of uh, Mauritania, uh, which is a big, uh, a big city now with a rapidly increasing population. And uh, since 10 years now, there has been a change in the water supply and just uh, uh, much more uh, volume of water is uh, brought daily to, just to the population. And in fact, there is a lot of water losses in the distribution network, and there is quite no uh, wastewater network. So this means that each house has its, its own pit for um, getting rid of, uh, of domestic wastewater. And this means that um, just a phreatic aquifer is recharged by the losses from the distribution network and from individual uh, wastewater. And since 11 years now, there is um, just a large areas in, uh, in the cities completely flooded by, uh, by this groundwater rise. And for instance, in, on this picture that you can see here, it's not at all surface water, it's groundwater just uh, outcropping and uh, reaching the, the soil uh, surface. So in, in this, the first case of uh, Spain, is the two other cases of uh, Algeria and Mauritania, which are rather uh, similar, it's uh, easy to, to explain. We will move to two other uh, examples, completely different. And in this, in the two cases of Australia and uh, Niger, uh, just the explanation if, is a change in uh, land cover and uh, land, uh, just uh, natural vegetation that has been uh, cut off and replaced by something else. In, um, I will start with, uh, with Australia. Just when the British colonists came more than one century ago, they decided to cut the eucalyptus uh, natural vegetation, which is, um, eucalyptus is a tree that is uh, evaporating a lot. And um, they, they cut it, just an uh, eucalyptus trees for, uh, making some uh, farms for, for sheep and, uh, and so on. And so the natural recharge was quite nil because nearly all the rainfall was taken by uh, evaporation for, for uh, eucalyptus trees. When the British colonists cut it, of course, there was a big, big increase in, uh, in groundwater recharge. But this groundwater, and by now, the estimates made by our uh, colleagues in Australia, it's at about uh, 50 millimeters per year when the natural uh, groundwater recharge was less than one millimeter per year. So this means that it's in one century, it has been multiply, multiplied by 100. But the long-term impact is also obviously an increase in the groundwater level, an increase in the drainage water going to, to the rivers, but also um, a drainage of salts that were kept in the soil. And this is why now, just groundwater and river waters are much more salty now than they were one century ago. 
because of this change in the vegetation. And if we go to, to Niger, we will find um, something uh, rather similar, just because of the demographic growth, uh, um, people have cut the natural vegetation and they replaced it by uh, millet fields. And by now, most of the area is covered by millet fields and um, some fallows, but mostly millet fields. Millet fields, this means that there is no obstacles, no, just the natural vegetation doesn't stop uh, the water surface, water or enough, uh, because um, you know, most of the year there is no obstacles, no, no limitation of, uh, of the surface uh, flow. So this means that um, we have much more water flowing over the slopes, much more water accumulating in uh, topographic depression, like this one we can see here. It's a former uh, hydrographic network that doesn't work because we are in much drier conditions now. But uh, this... Uh, these networks will get some, some water in the rainy season. And from this, uh, uh, this lake in, um, in the rainy season, there is a lot of water recharging the aquifer. And while in Australia we had a direct recharge with a diffuse recharge uh, and a groundwater recharge over the wool area, in uh, Niger, we have a recharge after uh, a focused, uh, this is a focused recharge after concentration of surface uh, runoff. And by now we have, um, our calculation shows that um, we have an increase in recharge, uh, it was multiplied by 10 in 50 years. So in both cases, this is very, very uh, uh, impressive in terms of, uh, of quantity of uh, recharge. In both cases, we have the same uh, consequence of uh, increasing salinity of, uh, of groundwater and, uh, and so on. And for um, just uh, the first uh, picture here is it's in Australia. Because this rise, uh, because of the rise of uh, groundwater, we have many places where salt will uh, appear at the surface, and there is no crop uh, possible any any longer in this area. In uh, in Niger, we have uh, the same uh, the same phenomenon, but uh, people will uh, take this uh, salt for selling it. So this is a bit different, and then just uh, other, in other places, they will do some uh, small uh, market uh, gardening. So it's, uh, but uh, the, the presence of permanent water will also have uh, sanitary consequences, uh, especially for paludism and uh, other, other diseases linked to with, uh, with water, like, uh, uh, Paludism and others. And we also have a lot of um, geotechnical consequences, especially, for instance, in this case in, in Wakshot, we have many buildings uh, falling down because um, of the, the permanent presence of, uh, of groundwater in the, in the wall foundation. So there's different examples to show how things are uh, interconnected. And uh, for instance, in, in, uh, in Mauritania, it's a very uh, important increase of uh, population in, in the capital was linked with the big droughts in the 70s and 80s and a, completely, a complete change in, uh, in the population distribution in, in the country. So this means that for me, just we always have close connection between environment, societies, and also techniques. Uh, when I mention, for instance, for instance, uh, the cheap price for uh, drilling and so on, it's very 
something very important in the changes uh, occurring in, in semi-arid areas. And so this means that for me, and this will be my, my conclusion, in, um, in front of all these things, uh, uh, all these changing, uh, changes uh, occurring now, we have to, to multiply um, just uh, the perspectives. We have to multiply the, the methods of investigation. We have to multiply the point of view from different di disciplines and so on. And we always have to consider a large range of uh, uh, time and scale, uh, uh, but sorry, time and space uh, scales of analysis. So this is why we always needed uh, an interdisciplinary work for getting these different uh, views over the same uh, scientific questions. And that's all. Thanks a lot. Uh, Christian, I, I have a, a little question. Um, oh, sure. You are talking <laughs> about uh, thinking which me method is better to understand this kind of, of situation that you could find in the fields. And you, you are saying that you have to, to think of a multiplicity at multiple uh ways of thinking to try to understand that th this kind of situation and one of the ways we most use is modeling and i want to know what is your opinion on using modeling uh to try to represent uh, the, the nature because modeling is helpful sometimes but sometimes it's is uh, um, a simplification that we use to to rely uh, and so I want you to know what what is your opinion on modeling is helpful or or is tricky <laughs> uh, just uh, for, for the, the very first part of your question is there any uh, better uh, method, uh, is there any, no, for me, it's always uh, depending on the local, uh, local situations. In, uh, in some cases, uh, you will have to, to develop uh, this method much more than the other. It, it will be different in, a, in, a, in other cases. So uh, you have to be adaptive. You have to be uh, flexible and to choose depending on the situation. About uh, the, the most uh, important part of your question, I've been uh, working with uh, groundwater modeling for uh, 40 years because my PhD work was, uh, was groundwater modeling. And since that time, I've always been uh, um, interested in, uh, in modeling, but always keeping in mind that uh, just modeling is uh, like the most beautiful girl in, uh, in the world. She can all, only give what she has. And uh, just for modeling, it's the same. We can expect from uh, models and from modelers more than they can uh, give. If you start modeling with um, uh, bad uh, assumptions, with bad uh, information, with uh, insufficient data, uh, even if your uh, modeler is a, is a good uh, modeler, uh, he can't do, or he or she uh, can't do any, any miracle. And so uh, it depends. In 
always modeling is um, just um, making things much simpler than they are in reality. So we, we have to accept that we decrease the, the level of accuracy, the level of uh, uh, fine tuning in a, in, a, in, a, in a modeling. So, but even in, uh, with this uh, decrease in, uh, in final representation of, uh, of reality, this can be very, very helpful because this may gives you, uh, give you um, another uh, view of, uh, about your, um, your questions. You, you may think a bit uh, differently, but, uh, but once again, it's, uh, it, depend, it depends on, uh, uh, I will give you just this example of uh, Central Tunisia. Some years ago, uh, there was um, a very good uh, student working in, uh, for a, his PhD, and um, he was uh, supervised by uh, somebody who is probably the, the guy who was the most uh, uh, efficient uh, guy in ground water modeling in, uh, in Tunisia. But because uh, this uh, supervisor decided to, to use only official uh, values of uh, groundwater pumping uh, and so on, which were completely underestimated, the final result was bullshit. We had this as just a good, a, a good model, a good modeler, but with bad, uh, Bad information. The final result was bullshit. Nothing. Uh, nothing else. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Uh, I also would like to. Rafael, Rafael is a question. Please, Rafael, go ahead. Thanks, Juno. Uh, thanks, Christian, for your nice presentation. It's, it's very nice to see how you have a, a huge experience in semi-arid regions. Uh, so I would like to know your opinion also about something. Uh, this year, the United Nations chose the thematic of the, day, the International Day Warrior it, it was the make the invisible visible. So it was an international call for face the challenges of the making the groundwater the unimportant source of water. So in your experience here in Semiarid, where we have a few uh, groundwater uh, sources. How is how we can respond to this international call? How make the groundwater important for our uh, semi-arid semi -arid regions? Yeah, so, thanks a lot for, for this uh, for this question. It's a it's a huge question because uh, once again uh, I will uh, start my uh, answer with a small. Uh, anecdote. Um, when I was uh, working in uh, Lake Chad Basin uh, many, many decades ago, um, I met, uh, I was working for a UNDP uh, project. And I met uh, a guy who, who was uh, working for a FAO project, UNDP FAO, uh, United Nations in, uh, in both cases, um, typically uh, uh, dealing with international things. And, uh, and um, the guy, this guy working in, uh, in this FL project, uh, he, he came to me and he asked me, but could you give me some information about groundwater availability in, uh, in, uh, in, this, in our project uh, area? 
because uh, this FAO project uh, has uh, started three years before, and finally nobody in uh, FAO uh, considered uh, the interest of looking at groundwater, which was the only uh, source of water for, um, for this development project. And even you may think that it's uh, a long time ago and things have improved from that time. But this means that even at that time, uh, that uh, uh, FAO was able to, uh, to build uh, a project of uh, irrigation development without looking at groundwater quality. So this means that for me, there, there is often a big, big discrepancy between uh, talks, between the discourses and reality. But overall, uh, I think that um, just this, uh, this year uh, information, uh, this year uh, claim of making uh, invisible visible is something very important and it's important everywhere in the world. Because even in France, you can find a lot of people in the French government who have, who have no ideas at all of uh, groundwater. And so they will um, discuss of uh, water management and so on, but they, they are completely uh, uh, unaware of, uh, of the big issues of, uh, of groundwater interest. And, and for instance, the long-term decrease in groundwater quality because of uh, agricultural uh, development, it's, uh, it's something that they, they want, to, they, they, they want to, to consider properly. So I think this is good to, to make uh, to, to use this uh, this year of uh, uh, making it visible, uh, yeah. But apart from this uh, this claim, which is very respected, uh, to respectful, is, is, this is very important. Just a real implementation. Uh, I'm. I'm sorry, but in some cases, just this, uh, just big, uh, just you, you can see it uh, in large letters and uh, without any, next year we will move to something else and uh, we will uh, forget every, everything. But at least for hydrogeologists, we can uh, explore this, uh, this, um, this claim of, of the year, but uh, I, I, I won't be that uh, enthusiastic for uh, long-term consequences. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. More questions for Christian? Oh, we have a we have a question in, in the chat uh, from Artur Duran. He said, "What the what will be the main challenges for for conceptual model to the case of the Sierra semi-arid on a with the dominant rocks, the crystalline, and more." the alluvian aquifer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Groundwater modeling in, uh, in the Sierra, it's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that easy at all. Yeah, I, uh, when I presented uh, this example of uh, influence of uh, termites in uh, in, uh, in sedimentary uh, layers of uh, Niger, we were in a rather uh, homogeneous uh, medium that we could consider as a typical uh, porous medium. 
And in fact, um, this porous medium is um, is main its main characteristics is heterogeneity. So even imagine even in porous media uh, we face uh, heterogeneity, and obviously in uh, in uh, crystalline uh, rocks in uh, in basement and so on, just heterogeneity is even worse in all dimensions. So. We come back more or less to, to the remark to the question by, uh, by Alison, uh, that in fact, we have to accept that uh, our uh, modeling will lose a significant part of the field heterogeneity. And we can't represent uh, everything the first question I will uh, ask is the question of the scale. Uh, is it relevant to, to model um, just a, a large area in, uh, for instance, the whole uh, interland of Sierra on one, uh, one uh, single model? For me, this has no, no meaning, no, no value. We have to, to to start with uh, with local uh, local models that that could help to 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 think about processes and uh, and so on. But I I will use them um, as a, a way to 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 test uh, different uh, assumptions. To, if this uh, works that way. Uh, is it um, compatible always, uh, for instance, with uh, with hydrodynamic information? Is it compatible with uh, geochemical information and so on? This is a way I, I will use uh, groundwater modeling first in uh, in Sierra. It's uh, like a, a kind of uh, uh, exploration tool not at all as um, something for a management tool. I'm, I think it's too, too early for, uh, for having a, a management tool uh, in, uh, with, uh, with groundwater models in, uh, in Sierra. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Julian. Christian, sorry. Uh, so, more questions to Christian? No? Okay, no more hands up. So, I think that's it. So, I think that's it. Thank you, Christian. Eduardo is not online now because he's in charity, so he means off. But anyway, thank you for, for your point, for your reviews, and for our discussion with the guys here. Now, this was a, a pleasure. It's even more efficient when we can discuss just on, uh, on the spot in, uh, in the field. It's more, uh, more, uh, more pleasant and more efficient. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, see, we, we, we do the best as we, as we can. So it's, uh, Okay, thanks to all and uh, have a good uh, have a good day. Okay, thank you. You too. Bye bye. Ciao. Thank you very much, Christian. Ciao. Ciao.